All right, students, thanks for tuning in. We're going to take a look at some of the concepts of assignment 10.1. So these slides will help you understand history of energy use, coal formation, petroleum extraction, use and future depletion, natural gas extraction and use, and alternative fossil fuels. So first history, people have long exploited energy sources. Coal, oil, gas, solar, and wind power were all used to some degree before 1200 BC. So we've learned how to harness the energy of nature. Fire, animal labor, labor, and hot springs were used long before that. But only since the Industrial Revolution in the early 1800s have we harnessed energy sources on a grand scale. Here are the energy sources used today. You'll see the first three are fossil fuels and then nuclear. These are all considered non-renewable. Nuclear energy um, runs from uranium. And then we have all these other ones, biomass, hydropower, solar, wind, geothermal, and tidal, which you're going to take a look at in assignment 9 point, I mean 10.2. So how do we form fossil fuels? Well, they're highly combustible substances formed from the remains of organisms from past geological ages. They're, they are the compressed tissues of plants and some animals from 100 to 500 million years ago that store chemical energy from photosynthesis and we should add algae to plants. This greatly concentrated energy is released when we burn coal, oil, or gas. That energy is ultimately captured um, from the sun through the process of photosynthesis. So what are the following steps in the formation of fossil fuels? Go ahead and pause. All right, let's see how you did. Should be four, one, three, two. This diagram shows that as well, both for a swampy area and ancient ocean. The main thing that we see here is that it's under anaerobic conditions because if it was aerobic conditions, all this organic matter would have decomposed into carbon dioxide and water vapor by the action of decomposers, anaero um, by the action of aerobic decomposers. So here we can see um, a layer of crude oil and um, here we see a layer of coal. So generally under swamps, which has more woody material, you get coal. And under, under the others, we get crude oil and natural gas. This layer that we, call, that we see here would be called a seam, a coal seam. And sometimes seams are maybe half a foot to maybe a couple feet or something like that in thickness. But you can see all, this, all these layers above the coal seam, that's what we would call overburden. And to get to the coal, you have to remove that first. All right, so we'll scroll, scroll through those. We can see that fossil fuel use has been rising for years. Even since 1950, um, we can see a significant increase in the, the use of especially oil and natural gas. Coal had already been used for a while in steam engines, but with the advent of the automobile, we started using more oil in the form of gasoline. So match the fuel with the country having the greatest reserves. Okay, let's see how you did. Did you say that natural gas was mostly from Russia, coal from the US, and oil from Saudi Arabia? China has a lot of coal too. We have more, but they end up using it more. So we can see here the summary of the distribution, and this is one of the questions in 10.1. And just to point out here that China uses the most coal, and they have the third biggest reserves. But we actually have twice as much coal as China, if we look at percent of the world reserves. Russia, you know, you can argue why is it that the US and Russia became such superpowers? Lots of reasons, but one certainly is that we have an amazing supply of resources. Both the US and Russia are um, very high in natural gas and coal. You can see that we're not even listed here in, for oil. All right, so cap per capita energy use, we can see that the US and Canada and the Middle East, in fact, this is Saudi Arabia specifically, are the biggest users of energy. Saudi Arabia is just sitting on top of uh, a ton of oil under their ground. And I guess going back here, no surprise probably that um, Africa is using so little. I'm actually a little surprised that these are tan. This graph is probably from the mid 2000s which is when our textbook was published. All right, what is the second most used fossil fuel for electricity in the US? 
So if you said natural gas, that is correct. That's number two. Coal is number one, but in California, natural gas is number one for us. And order the following energy sources from most used to least used for electricity generation. Go ahead and pause. Okay, did you say three, one, five, four, two? Coal number one, then natural gas, then nuclear, then hydroelectric, and then finally wind. Here's a nice, a nice graph showing that from 2010. And we can see hydropower is only 6%. Other renewables, that's where wind and solar would both lie. So they're, they're actually very small components. But wind is growing the fastest of all the renewable energy sources. Let's take a closer look at coal. Like this guy, gets a good look at it every day. Coal is the plant and microorganism remains compressed under high pressure to form dense carbon material. It was first used 3,000 years ago. It, is, it powered the Industrial Revolution in England and then in other countries, including the U.S. Today it is surpassed by oil, but is still the most abundant fossil fuel. We have um, over a thousand years, probably, or well, several hundred to a thousand years worth of reserves in the earth. And it provides one fourth of the world's commercial energy consumption. What is the second best type of coal? Meaning, best meaning the highest carbon content and lowest moisture content. All right, so did you say bituminous? Uh, if you did, that's correct. This is actually really easy to remember because very fortunately it goes in alphabetical order a then b then sub b and then we have ligate and then peat so here we see a diagram of that peat is like the early stage of decomposition of all that woody material and then with more pressure with more heat we get less moisture and more compression so higher carbon content How coal is formed? Peat is partially decayed organic matter near the surface. It becomes coal as it gets heated and compressed over time. We've kind of talked about that, so go ahead and take a closer look if you'd like it, if you'd like to. But we should point out the anthracite clean it burns the cleanest because it burns the hottest and it has the lowest sulfur content. Those are two important things. And when we talk about a type of coal burning hotter, that means for one, we're more likely to get complete combustion in the form of carbon dioxide as opposed to carbon monoxide. Okay, so here you can see coal production. Um, China is number one, both in production and consumption. We do have bigger reserves, but they are mining and processing more of that reserve. We see here a couple of diagrams about how coal is mined. We have subsurface mining and then strip mining. And um, so I asked you some questions about relative advantages and disadvantages. Obviously, one big disadvantage of subsurface is that the mine could collapse and that could kill workers. And um, another thing is that it's a more hazardous work environment because it can be very low oxygen down here or if there are toxic fumes being emitted by any of the rock material they become concentrated and the workers are exposed to high levels leading to lung cancer and other um, other maladies or diseases and here you can see a little ventilation though tube happening and with strip mining we talked about some of those um, in class one of the big problems is the acid mine drainage that we're leaving behind exposed rock and that rock often contains sulfur and then when you combine that sulfur with the oxygen in the air you get sulfur dioxide when you add water now you get hydro I'm sorry you get sulfuric acid runoff and that can lower the pH significantly of creeks and things like that so how do we actually get electricity from coal Coal is used mostly to generate electricity, uh, and here's how it works. We have the, the loader dropping the coal into the coal bunker, pulverizing mill, so it kind of crushes it up, feeds it into the furnace, which is already hot enough, so it, it ignites pretty quickly, pretty readily. The heat is used to turn water to steam, and that steam is at a very high pressure, which means it's really trying to blast its way out of this pipe, 
And so it comes as a form of a pretty intense wind through the turbine. And these turbine blades, they're like fan blades. They turn, and as they turn, they're turning a generator, which makes electricity. Then this steam goes into a cold area um, where this is surrounded by cool water. So the steam condenses back to liquid. This area is called the condenser. And then it goes around for another trip. Here's the cooling loop. So this is, has one sole purpose, and that is to remove heat from the water in the condenser and um, put it back into, into the atmosphere, or not back, but put it out into the environment. So what we see coming out of cooling towers is often billowing smoke. And um, oftentimes that smoke is white because it's really just, um, it's really just clouds, water vapor. As soon as that water vapor hits the air, it condenses into little droplets and we see it. But of course, out of the smokestacks, this is where the exhaust from the combustion is happening. And so this smoke actually contains a lot of stuff that we've talked about. Um, sulfur oxides, CO2, CO, um, some nitrogen oxides as well. But we do use filters to try to get rid of the particulates. We send it through those smokestack scrubbers to try to get rid of the sulfur oxides. And, um, and ultimately we go and dispose of this ash. But the big thing about electricity generation is any way you can get this generator to turn, you will produce electricity. So it doesn't have to be coal that you're using as your heat source. It could be natural gas. It could be biomass, like burning woody material. It could be nuclear power, the energy, the heat from nuclear reactions. Um, and in, in some cases, they've experimented with uh, taking mirrors and focusing the solar energy on pipes to make them heat up and boil. And so that's some kind of innovative application for solar electricity. You should know these general um, parts, though, I've, as I've labeled them here. If you're going to do some cogeneration, you would take this um, hot water in the condenser, and you would, um, uh, or actually, you take the hot water coming back from the condenser, going to the cooling tower, and you would run that hot water through a building to generate some heat, to heat up the office in the wintertime, things like that. All right, so which of the following pollutants come out of an electric power plant cooling tower? So we just talked about that. Let's see how you do here. Yep, it's those three. Remember, sulfuric acid is actually a secondary pollutant, so it does not come out of the um, smokestack. And ozone, that's, that's photochemical smog from burning gasoline in cars, not from burning coal, because it requires VOCs, which is like unburned gasoline. All right, now let's take a look at oil. And I'll tell you what, we'll pause here and I'll check you in at the next part.